the chancellor of the Grossmont Cuyamaca Community College District, my boss, Dr. Cindy Miles. Hi, everybody. How are you doing this evening? This, I won't take but a moment, and I'm just going to reiterate the welcome that Dr. Zakovic gave you. It gives us tremendous pleasure for our colleges to be used for such a fabulous educational event as this. Educational. We're not the host, but we are the location, and it gives us great pleasure. How many of you have attended Grossmont or Cuyamaca College? Thank you. Voted in the last election to support Prop B and Prop R. Thank you. You make these buildings possible. You make the learning possible that occurs every day. And I want to salute all of you. This is Friday night. Good grief. You're going to a political debate on a Friday night. Good for you. Good for you. Many of you came when you have your mind made up, you think, for who you would like to vote for. Some of you are here to help yourselves make those decisions. But in either case, you are, do, you are participating in such an integral part of what it means to be an American, and I applaud you. You're participating in the democratic process tonight. Yes, so thank you all for doing your part, and thank you for being at Cremont College. gentlemen and welcome to the 2014 congressional debate for California 50th district. Um, I'm Seth Lynn, I'm the director of Veterans Campaign, which is the host for tonight's event. Um, before we introduce everyone, I just want to go over a couple of administrative issues. Uh, at a previous debate, I believe right here, uh, a situation occurred where um, uh, someone got on stage who wasn't actually a candidate and decided to debate as well. Uh, there's a great YouTube of it, I encourage you to watch it. Um, we all believe, and the Veterans Campaign believes, in everyone's right to express their opinions, and the two candidates who you'll hear from tonight have defended that right. Um, but that should not impinge on your right to hear their opinions as well. And so, I just want to say that if anyone here is, decides to come up on the stage, that, that is prohibited. And if, you, if anyone is disruptive um, and is taken away from your ability to actually hear from both candidates, we will ask that they be removed. So just want to make sure we have that. Uh, over ahead of time, but you definitely should watch that YouTube video. Um, as I said, my name is Seth Lynn. Um, I'm the director of Veterans Campaign. We are a, a program that uh, is dedicated to getting veterans involved in public service. I'm here tonight with Professor Carl Luna of uh, San Diego Mesa College, where he teaches political science. He's also the director of the Institute for Civil Civic Engagement, which is something that we certainly support in my organization. Veterans Campaign is a program of the National Association for Uniformed Services, and we are dedicated to the idea of getting more veterans involved in running for office, working in public service, and so forth. And so it's especially excited tonight to be sponsoring a debate between two nominees who have served their country honorably and are now continuing to serve their country again in public service. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the incumbent, Representative Duncan Hunter on the GOP side, and the challenger, Democratic nominee, James Kimber. We will begin with opening remarks from the two candidates, three minutes each, and we have a coin toss behind the uh, curtain. It was on ESPN 14. And Mr. Kimber won the toss. You may begin your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by thanking Cooley Macker College for this uh, venue. It's my first time actually here in this beautiful venue. I'd like to thank our host, uh, Veterans Campaign, and the National Association for Uniform Services. Thank uh, our moderators, Mr. Paul Luna and uh, Seth. 
Uh, I'm a physician assistant in practice up at Palomar Medical Center, and I'm also a veteran. I served 20 years in the United States Navy, a lot of it here in San Diego County. Uh, I come from a, actually a long line of military family. My father and grandfather both served in World War II. They were both Navy doctors. And over the years, I've never been involved in politics as much as I am right now, but I've certainly watched what's happened over the past several years. And I think, like many people, have been very frustrated at what I call the lack of action by Congress. I think there are many issues, particularly that are facing this part of the San Diego County, that could be addressed, but yet uh, some of our elected officials are choosing either not to or postponing, or some tend to use the phrase, kicking the can down the road. So I began talking to people, and I feel like reaching across and talking to everyone within the district about the problems that we're facing find that we can have these conversations and we can solve these problems. So that's why I decided to run and that's why I'm here this evening and I hope I can count on your support. Uh, I look forward to your questions this evening and I thank Mr. Hunter for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you. Good evening everybody. My name is Duncan Hunter. I'm right now your uh, representative if you live here in the East or North counties. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Kimber and everybody who put this together, most importantly all of you for showing up. It's a Friday night, it's, uh, it's a uh, Jewish New Year right now, I'm not sure if we have any Jewish folks in the audience, but thanks for being here during your New Year, we appreciate it. There's one over there. Um, here's, here's what I, I, I believe in, they didn't go through our, our uh, bios I don't think, but I, I worked here in town, I went to San Diego State University, uh, University Grand Hills High School, was working in the industry doing high tech stuff, joined the Marine Corps on 9 11, did two Iraq tours, one Af Afghanistan tour, and got elected in 2008 when the, the uh, uh, Democrats controlled everything from 2008 to 2010. That's when Obamacare was passed, that, that's when uh, the big tarp bailouts were passed. That's, that's when a whole lot of government spending went into effect when we were in the minority, meaning the Republicans. We then took the majority, and since 2010, we passed hundreds of bills to the Senate trying to do stuff. Here's, here's what I base my uh, votes on and the way that I represent you. I think that there's the, that the only way that our government works, that our system works, is that people govern themselves. I believe in freedom for each and every one of us as individuals. If, if the government rules over you or makes all the rules and regulations, then they stifle that entrepreneurship and that free spirit that we have as Americans. That's, that's what makes America great. And I, I, I like to base each and every one of uh, my votes and my my, my opinions or my TV things, I try to do it all based off of those principles, that we can govern ourselves better than the government can govern us. Because we know what's right for us and our families. And, and that's what I try to bring to the job. It's an honor to be here, it's an honor to represent you now, and I look forward to this debate. And I want to thank Mr. Kimber too for doing this, and thank him for his service. When I first ran, it was against the Navy SEAL. And it, it was Marines versus Navy there, and it's Marines versus Navy again. I, I think it's a good competition, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. We're going to proceed with two rounds of questioning. The first round, questions will be presented by your co-moderators here to the candidates. They'll have two minutes to respond with a one-minute rebuttal. And the second round, after about a half hour of our questions, we'll turn to questions that were collected from you, the audience, either when you registered online or as you came in and filled out cards. We've kind of sorted through them, tried to condense so we don't have a lot of repetition, overlap, cleaned up the language a little bit, and ready to go. Uh, for those, we'll have a uh, one minute response with a 30 second rebuttal so we can get in as many as we can. Uh, Mr. Hunter, you will take the first question from Mr. Wynn. Congressman Hunter, um, do you support the current administration's cut to defense, and how do we make sure that we have a strong enough national defense while not breaking the budget? So, to answer the uh, first question, no, not at all. Um, number, number two, you have, you have to fix defense the same way that you have to fix the entitlement system. Half of what we spend on the military, we spend about $650 billion a year on the military. Half of those costs go to personnel costs. So what, what you're doing is, is you're saying, well, we, we can't build any, any more ships, we can't build any more airplanes, we can't build any more tanks, because the personnel cost in the military is taking money from those things. Just like in our entitlement system, if you don't reform our entitlement system, you're not gonna have any Social Security, you're not gonna have any Medicare, you're not gonna have Obamacare, frankly, because the money's being eaten by those things, and you still have to have things like the FBI, like, like the military, things that the federal uh, government does spend money on. So the, the military is like that. 
First personnel costs are eating away at your weapon systems, and we can't build what we need to fight the wars where we need to fight them. If you notice, there's a lot of bad people out there right now in a lot of different parts of the world, and it costs a lot of money to be able to fight in those in all of, of those different places at the same time. In order to do that, you have to have the people, but you also have to have the systems. The only way you can spend more on the military is by fixing the entitlement system that's, that's pulling money within the military with the personnel and the regular entitlement system. Let me, let, me, let me mention one, one last thing. If you cut out everything, if you absolutely cut the U.S. military down, down to zero, you got uh, rid of the FBI, the Department of Energy, the Department of Labor, the departments of everything, we would still run a deficit in the billions every year due to in entitlement spend, due to Medicare, Social Security, and Obamacare. So you could cut everything, and with just those entitlements, you would still run a deficit. So those would have to, those things have to get fixed so we can spend money on things like, like the military and like transportation and infrastructure, building roads and bridges. So I would ask, um, I, I agree with cutting the entitlements, but what I don't understand when it comes to the military budget is how can you authorize pay or continued funding for things like tanks that the Secretary of the Army doesn't want or uh, you know, it's half a billion dollars for tanks that were ordered that even the General of the Army said he didn't want. How about the blimp that was built for the Army? $297 million. The Command and Control Center built out in Afghanistan, uh, $35 million for a 64,000 square foot facility that would have helped out a lot of veterans who are homeless these days. The F-22 uh, Raptor that was just used in service this week for the very first time, yet it's been in service for the past 10 years, originally budgeted $197 million. Now the GAO estimates it's about over 400 million per plane. F-35 has still yet to see any service. We're still using aircraft, the F-18s, that are great at doing the job. I mean, they perform these strikes. I support a strong defense, but let's build equipment for the future. I, I support the development of the UAVs. Uh, there are other systems that need to be developed for strong, uh, for strong defense for Conflicts of the future, not building weapons for conflicts of the past. Do I get to rebuttal? One minute rebuttal. Sure. I would agree with you in all of those things. The problem is Congress has no say on those things anymore. There is, there is a, a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse within the DOD acquisition and, and uh, procurement system. Congress doesn't say you're, you're going to keep this or you're going to keep that. And by the way, you're going to have massive cost overruns. That's, that's done in the acquisition department within the military. We, we do have things like the Predator, like the un unmanned aerial vehicle that's made here in San Diego. The Air Force didn't want that because the Air Force has pilots. The last thing pilots want is an unmanned aerial vehicle. So Congress made them have the Predator. Congress forced the Air Force to have the Predator, and now look what it is. So there's instances where we can get things like that in, but there's other instances where, for instance, the, the A-10, that's our, our big tank killer close air support airplane, the Air Force doesn't want to do close, uh, close air support anymore. There is no other close air support airplane, so we said, Air Force, you have to keep the A-10 until there's a viable alternative because of the men on, on the ground need it. So we can make them keep some stuff, but the overruns, the cost overruns, and the inefficiencies, that's what the, in the Pentagon. I mean, Senator Coburn even wrote in his waste book of last year about this blimp. I mean, $297 million for a blimp was never even used, but I mean, I can't understand even building a blimp. I mean, I. I served on board ships, but I, I do understand military technology, and they were using it. Their, their goal was to use it for surveillance over Afghanistan, yet we have the Global Hawk UAV, which has an airtime of 30 hours, has the Argus camera from 25,000 feet, can read the text on your uh, cell phones. I don't know why we're even looking at projects like that to even develop much less fun, but I mean... Well, I'll tell you, the Army comes to us... Excuse me, we're not doing back, back and forth. Okay. Okay. One minute, uh, that we pick it up in your closing remarks. Sorry. Unfortunately, debates as they're structured, it's not actually a conversation. <laughs> Our second question will come from me to uh, Mr. Kimber. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, uh, Americans, indeed, all free men must remember that the final choice, a soldier's pack is not as heavy a burden as a prisoner's chains. It implied that we were all supposed to take part in our national defense. When he said that, the majority of young men in America would go and see military service. The Yale graduating class, the majority would go. Last year, just a couple of people went into military service. After Vietnam, we moved from the draft to the professional military. Not volunteers, these people are paid, and they're patriots 
who agreed to give us service. In these last two wars, we have required these patriots to do uh, service tour after tour after tour. My question is, since we've moved away from the draft, has this actually helped us more in terms of our strategic advantage we get with a better military, or is that outweighed by the fact that most American households do not have skin in the game? So they may be more willing to use our professional soldiers in situations they shouldn't be. And indeed, if we don't have people serving in uniform, shouldn't we all be required to take some public role in serving our country? Well, you look at the model in Israel where everybody there is required to serve two years. And I, I look at today's uh, leaders within Congress and there's less than, I think it's less than 10% or less than 15% actually had any service. And then look at the members who have served and how they vote and how they view certain things. And certainly do, they do have a better or I would say greater perspective when it comes to uh, particularly today's uh, the events of the world today. But in terms of, are you asking me to bring back a draft? I, I guess I didn't. Would you support restoring a draft or some other form of universal service so everyone can take their share of the soldiers? Well, I, again, okay. The Secretary of Defense was naming cuts that he wanted to make to the forces, but now in light of things, I don't think we're going to be able to make those kind of cuts. Yet we still have members stationed throughout the world that continues to grow. Uh, when I was in the Navy, the first time I ever visited Bahrain was in the late 90s, early 2000s, and we literally had two buildings. Now, the last time I was there, 10 years ago, they actually have a full base. So we are becoming uh, spread out throughout the world where permanent bases we're going to have to we're going to need more service members in but I, I don't know if a draft is the right way though I don't know that forcing people to sign up I, I think we need to probably build a bit bigger of a force if we're going to keep uh, stationing them overseas though Mr. Hunter no well, I don't think that we should have a draft I think you have the best military that you have right now because you have the people who are in the military right now join they, they know that they're going to uh, Iraq they know they're going to Afghanistan, Philippines, Korea, Europe. They know that what they're going to be doing, and they join for a, a uh, reason, and that's to go do. And, and, and these, if you join the military now, you know that you're going to be go doing uh, something. You're not going to be sitting here stateside. We have great patriots in the military, and they've joined to go do something. And, and I think that's a great thing. I don't think you ought to have a draft to meet people who don't really want to serve, serve with those who do. I think it would drag down the entire U.S. military morale. One minute rebuttal or discussion? Continue? No, I'm <laughs> We move to the next question. And uh, to, Mr. to Mr. Hunter. Congressman Hunter, how do we get the economy moving again and create more jobs for the folks in the 50th District of Southern California? Okay, so how do we create jobs? Number one, Congress doesn't create any jobs. The uh, federal government does not create jobs. Well, what we do is we, we, we should be able to make it so that it's not it's so that those jobs are growing on their own. We're supposed to in, incentivize the uh, federal government is supposed to get out of the way. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Corporations are moving offshore. That's why you don't have any manufacturing in the U.S. anymore. It's it's in, it's impossible to manufacture. Not just because of that highest corporate tax of uh, thirty five percent, but because Try opening up a manufacturing business here in San Diego. Ten, ten years and, and five lawsuits later, you'll be shutting down and you open up in uh, Texas or Idaho or Utah or Nevada or, or places where all of our families have gone because it's so hard to do, to do business in a state like, like California. So un, unfetter the businesses in this country. Put us on par at the corporate tax rate with everybody else in the world so that Chinese companies want to come here and do business. So that uh, you know, in Indian companies want to come here and, and do business, so that we aren't going over there. there there's no way you're going to have companies staying in, in the United States, United States, in this international world now of uh, business, when we're totally uncompetitive on our tax rates. So you got to make us even. Once you once you make us even, I have no doubt in my mind that we are the smartest. We are the smartest, the most the most productive, and the most efficient people in the world, and we'll get the job done. But the government's got to get out of the way. Um, I don't disagree with you. The government is not here to tell people how to live their lives or how to solve their problems. 
But I will say that there are industries within the 50th district, within San Diego County, that I think could benefit from someone who's championing these. Look at uh, the early model earlier this year, Tesla, who now moved off to Nevada to get um, their company going because they got a great offer to do jobs there. David Branson, uh, founder of Virgin Airlines, just recently made a big donation or investment, I'm sorry, into 3D Robotics, which is located here in San Diego County. And this is a company that makes UAVs or drones. And these are not the military drones, these are for civilian use, and we could discuss it later, but there are many uses for UAVs. And my fear is if they're looking at investing in a company such as that, I mean, what's to stop them from now moving that to Nevada or Texas, some other state that's going to woo them away? I'd rather see that company stay here and those jobs stay here. Uh, you, you sit on a committee actually for UAVs and what I find is mostly is that people misunderstand UAVs and what they can be used for. A uh, few people know that actually 43% of UAVs sold in 2012 were for agriculture. And the 50th district is very heavily for agriculture. But you talk about um, incentivizing, and I agree, but solar is another industry. And there are many solar programs within San Diego County. That's the kind of I'm for keeping jobs in San Diego. I'm not talking that government is the answer, but I think you know, as a representative, you could help champion that for someone who sits on some of these committees. One minute rebuttal. <laughs> you aren't going to see anybody come up here and say, I'm for jobs in San Diego, or I'm, I'm not for jobs in San Diego. I, I think we're all for jobs in San Diego. You, you don't do that by having the, one of the highest tax rates in the United States in this state. That, that's why companies are leaving California. They're not, they're not leaving California because there's not enough government, because there's not a, enough regulation here, they want to go to, to Texas, they're, they're leaving this state because we over-regulate them. We over-tax them and, and, and they leave. But, but I'm here for, I, I, I champion Temecula wine, uh, cut flowers from Fallbrook and Escondido, av avocados from Fallbrook, We've got a big ag area, we have, we have some great manufacturers here in East County, we have great schools here in East County, and I champion all of, of those things. But it's not up, to the government. It's not up to these uh, uh, bureaucracies to pick winners and losers. That's not the government's job. That's what we do. We the people do that. But you say, okay, I, I know that you do champion the wine industry. Oh, moderator, I thought we were, what are we doing? <laughs> are we done with our one minute? Oh, no, Mr. I, I know you do champion the wine industry. You're, you're co-chair of the Wine Caucus, however, uh, as a citizen, I got involved with the wine industry last year because of a local ordinance that restricted the way they did business. Managed to get a meeting with the county supervisor and the heads of the Vintners Association. And they were able to work through that. Right now, they're facing another problem, which is uh, one up in uh, Central California was put out of business because they're being fined for using volunteers uh, during their great picking season. And locally, the boutique wineries here, which are about 60, because it's more than just what's up in Temecula, they're now faced with possibly losing their wineries as well because they use these volunteers. I've been talking with local elected leaders, maybe that they could introduce something that will exempt them. But again, for somebody who sits on a committee, you actually co-chair and you've told us how you actually champion that. I wonder if you're aware of these situations that exist with this industry in your district. Closing remarks. I'm going to invoke my right, as we talked about, for a uh, moderator follow-up. There'll be a one-minute response uh, per person. Just the, the issue of government and creating jobs. Uh, we're in a community college. Everybody here has got a job. I got a job. Everybody in the stage has worked for government and has a job. In San Diego, the military is one of the leading employers. Might it be better to say government is not always the best place to create jobs? Government is not always the best place to initiate things in the economy, but government has a role to play, and sometimes government can help in the economy. You know, Mr. Hunter, then Mr. Kimber. Sure. It is not the government's job to create jobs. I, I would disagree with this premise. Jobs are a, are a byproduct of national security and national defense in places like San Diego. We don't, we don't uh, build ships here to create jobs. We build ships in San Diego to uh, protect American interests interest throughout the world. Jobs are a byproduct of that. Defense means jobs in San Diego. We don't build bridges and roads just to put people to work. We build bridges and roads because they need to be built. My uh, Democrat colleagues, 
would, would like to build things just to build things, just to say that they've created jobs. That is not le uh, lasting economic impact. I would ask the audience to please show the respect that, that is these candidates deserve. Thank you. Creating jobs just to uh, uh, create short-time jobs has no lasting economic impact. It is not manufacturing, it is not making things in this country, it is not uh, America buying those things. They are fake, taxpayer paid for jobs. It's cheaper if you just give people the money, frankly, than create these jobs that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per job to create, but don't even pay out that much to the person who's, who's uh, doing it. Mr. Kimber, one minute, please. I I'm glad that you actually used that example because going back to the tanks, it's exactly what they're doing. They're building these tanks to create jobs just to have jobs because they've testified they don't need the tanks. We have more tanks than we need. We have to maintain them. Um, you know, go back to an age when my parents were involved in World War II and they were building ships in a matter of weeks. We are Americans. If we need tanks, I bet we could turn them out in a matter of days. But they are doing that just to keep jobs. So you're saying that it's the Democrats who want to build jobs just to have a job. I, I would argue it's not just the Democrats. No conversation. Um, we move to uh, my question. Let's begin with uh, Mr. Kimber, then it goes to Mr. Hunter. Uh, my question comes regarding this thing called education. Uh, back in the 19th century, we decided we wanted an industrial workforce, had a primary and secondary education. It was a public good, we provided it from the public expense. Now we tell our students, you've got to have K through 14 if you're going to make it. K through 16 if you can get it. Yet when I went to school, I could put myself through a, a USD on a uh, hardware job. It's a lot harder for students to get ahead. If we expect the next generation to be able to provide us with the skills that we need to be state competitive, is it fair to burden them with massive amounts of student debt to achieve the student good or the public good? Is there some way we can provide more affordable public education in America for K through 14, K through 16? Okay, um, I, I agree that we are burdening our students with um, sometimes insurmountable debt. I mean, it was the American dream to go to college, graduate, and buy a home. Nowadays, people graduate and they already have a mortgage. It's called a student loan. Uh, they're not able to buy that home. I know uh, Senator Warren has proposed a bill that would actually lower the interest rates for student loans that have been afforded to a lot of businesses and banking, and I agree with that. I, I think to burden these students with uh, large amounts of debts. I mean, I work with many students throughout the district that are trying to get into either college or into grad school, and some of them are graduating with over $100,000 in debt. And very few are going to actually get jobs that will pay for that kind of debt. So uh, I, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know how you correct the cost of education, but I do believe that we need to change the rates and be able to allow them, as Senator Warren has suggested, to refinance under a lower rate. First of all, the government now handles all, all uh, Pell Grants and, and all, all student loans now. They, they now go through the U.S. government. They are not ruled by the market. So what these, these universities know, as they raise their uh, fees year after year after year, the government goes along with them with taxpayer dollars. Why wouldn't you make education more expensive if you know that the taxpayers are going to subsidize it? That's, that's why education gets more and more expensive every year. When I went to SDSU, in the 1990s, it was about 1,200 bucks a semester. And I worked at San Diego in Parkway Plaza making 425 an hour and doing some website stuff and, and I could make 1,200 bucks twice a year. And that, that's what I, I actually used to pay for school. If the government reimburses you at whatever rate you're gonna charge, it's gonna be more expensive. Number two, I introduced a bill with Senator Wyden and Senator Rubio. Rubio's a Republican, Wyden's a Democrat, called the, the No Before You Go Act. Meaning, kids, kids go to college, and they, they major in, in history or poli sci, and no, you know, those are great majors, but they major in those, and they say, where's my $60,000 a year job? You gotta know what you are, are, are uh, getting into. Don't spend all the money going to school for something that's not gonna get you where you want to be afterwards. 
If you want to make that much money, you should know how many kids graduate from the school, what their median salary is, what, what kind of jobs that they're going to get afterwards. you got to know this stuff. That's how you empower the individual, take government out of it, make, make the universities tell us why we should send our kids to that uh, university, and that, that's how you bring costs down, improve education for everybody, and actually provide more access because then you'll have more kids going to where they actually need, need to go, not, not just going to college, as many people do just to go to college. You can get a job at the shipyard at NASCO in downtown San Diego for $60,000 a year welding about a year and a half after high school. That, that's a pretty great job that doesn't require a, a, a university education. One minute, Mr. Kimber. The no before you go bill, what's the status of that bill? It's in the Senate, and as we know, the Senate does nothing whatsoever. <laughs> The question is, you said the government is subsidizing these, so you're saying that they'll go ahead and charge whatever, basically whatever the market's going to bear, or whatever the government's going no, to pay. the government has set the rate. Okay, for, for then why market. don't you change that? It, it was changed until Democrats okay. changed it to have the government set the student loan rate. They set the student loan rate. The student uh, loan rate. You're mixing on rebuttal. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Governor. Ah, that's okay. You can answer. He's throwing it back to you. I was like, what was the question again? I'm sorry. I was waiting. Well, I just, you were saying that if the government is subsidizing, basically, if we're setting the The government rate. sets the interest rates for student loans right now. It was not like that three or four years ago. We, it used to be, it used to be market-based. If the government set the interest rate, that's like price fixing. In a, a competitive free market environment, you're never going to see the lowest cost and the uh, most efficiency and the best quality with price controls set through the uh, federal government. That's why education is getting more expensive and the quality is going down. Next question for Mr. Lind and Mr. Hunter. Congressman Hunter, um, to achieve energy independence, excuse me, to achieve energy independence, uh, do you think we should be exploring alternative energies, uh, deregulating restrictions on fracking and more traditional sources of energy, or doing both? You should be doing both, but, but let's make this easy. Number one, you, you should not be doing solar and wind turbines in, in places where people in the back country have to see it every day, where it, it kills birds, where it stops people from going motorcycle riding, hiking, mountain biking, hunting. Please, you know, please show the candidates the respect they're showing each other. But what you have is you have, you have all these things as you go east of here that were done on federal land and they were, they were contracts negotiated in, into by the federal government and private agencies. You get no, no say in that. I get no, no say in it. They could be Spanish companies, Indian companies. They don't even have to be American companies. And that's what you see when you see those, those giant uh, wind turbines. So we should use those, but we ought to put them where, play, where, where they ought to be, not where they're going to burn down, for instance, Julian or uh, Ramona. And you've got to be very careful where you do these alternative energy products and where you also don't stop things like off off-roading in, in uh, Placer City. Number, number two, the EPA and this administration have, have completely stopped new oil exploration in this country. The Keystone Pipeline, it's been years. The Republicans, the Republicans have begged and begged and begged the uh, president of this country and the Democrat Senate to pass the Keystone Pipeline. And they absolutely say no, because by the president's own words and by, by Democratic admission, the higher your gas tax is, the more likely you are to buy the new energy-efficient light bulb, and that's what they want. That, that's what Democrats want. Mr. Kimber. Okay. Uh, with respect to solar, but there are other ways to use the solar within the district. Uh, I, I work at a hospital that was just recently built, Palomar's, a billion-dollar facility, yet not a single solar. Uh, you talked again about incentivizing. I mean, there are companies ready right now to donate solar through tax credits to nonprofit organizations. And a lot of the schools, I've seen this up in Los Angeles where they have these parking overhangs, and these are donated through uh, companies that will get the tax benefit. There are a lot of commercial companies that would probably start using these, but again, to use your word, to incentivize. And I, why isn't that being done more? I, I would agree with these not putting the solar out on just a big lot or making a solar farm. I, I don't dispute that, but why can't we do more to encourage 
commercial people to uh, put this in. In terms of other alternative energy, I mean, look at the electric car. It's, it, they tried it 10 years ago, for whatever reasons it went away, but it's here to stay now. And it's only going to get bigger. But why don't we invest more in charging stations? I mean, I've driven around and seen charging stations maybe one per 30 parking spaces. And you're only going to see more and more cars being developed. And this is the new wave of alternative energy. This is a way of developing jobs, too, because you're going to need to install these, add them to the grid. Um, there are other ways through alternative energy. I understand the XL pipeline that, you know, the argument is they're still refining this oil whether we bring it down here or not. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's the argument to have because this is not really going to make us that energy dependent, independent as much as investing more in the alternative energies. Mr. Kimber, I think you want to run for county supervisor. True. At the federal level, as, as your representative, it's my responsibility and, and my job to say, here is all of your hard-earned tax money. I keep hearing, why don't we see more of this? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Why don't we do this? It's your money. I, I have a say, as does the, uh, the rest of the U.S. Congress, on where your money goes. I, I'm not going to spend your money on charging stations. If the state wants to build charging stations, they can build charging stations. If the county wants to build charging stations, they can build charging stations. If the city wants to build charging stations, they can build charging stations. But as your representative, it's not my job to spend your money on electrical charging stations, which, by the way, how do you get the electricity for the Tesla in the first place? You've you got to get the electricity somewhere. It, it burns. You, you have emissions creating that energy to then charge your electric vehicle. You can have emissions no matter where you go unless you go for nuclear energy. And this administration has made it clear that, that they don't support nuclear energy. If you want to go green, you go nuclear. And what this administration doesn't want to do is go nuclear. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, I understand nuclear power. I served on board a nuclear aircraft carrier and actually went through training in the Navy. So I understand it. The biggest problem I think we all understand is it's not just the threat of an accident or tsunami or earthquake like they experienced in Japan and we're afraid of what would happen in uh, San Clemente, but what about waste? Okay, nobody has ever really addressed that. Uh, if you understand the half life of radiation, we we're talking over 5,000 years for a half life. So. Nobody's found any kind of adequate solution to where it's going to be stored. I mean, honestly, would you want that stored in Alpine, or would you like it stored out in Julian? Would you feel safe with that? Are you asking me? Yes, sir. We have, we have nuclear power plants in San Diego Bay. They're called Navy ships. Mr. Kimber should, uh, should know that. So we, we, we have them now, and they're obviously safe enough to have in the bay. I was talking about the waste. The waste is in the Valley, and that's where it ought to be put. I, I asked if you would like, like to have it in, in your backyard. No, I do not want the waste in Alpine, oh, okay. Julian. I want it in the uh, Nevada desert where we've been putting it. <laughs> I would say that we're not going to be in Nevada in the uh, To Mr. Kimber, uh, Veterans Campaign website, veteranscampaign.org, yes, I got it right, uh, includes polling results that show the American public has four times as much more confidence in the military than in the Congress. That's been a trend line for about four years. In no small part, this is because of a public view that politics just doesn't function. Washington just, just doesn't function. And extreme polarization may well have something to do with that. There are empirical studies to show we're more polarized as a people than any time since the 60s. The House is more polarized than it's been since the 1880s. Uh, what can be done to try to bring back a middle ground in a society where we the people means compromise? Everyone's supposed to get something. What would you do if you were elected? to restore civility to uh, our political dialogue. Well, if I'm elected, I obviously, what needs to be done is working across the aisle. Um, you just can't get everything done working with in your own party alone. Uh, in the military, you talk about military service members doing things maybe a little bit differently. Uh, you know, we kid each other, Mr. Hunter being in the Marine Corps, myself having been in the Navy, but when it comes time to getting the job done, we work together. It doesn't matter what service we came from, Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, we all work together for what needs to be done, getting the job done. 
I think it needs to be people willing to work across the aisle. Uh, I know Mr. Hunter has done this on occasion, so I'm not saying he hasn't, but again, maybe that comes from his military background. But that's what needs to be done. There has to be a compromise. It can't be this my way or no way. Unless I came up with the idea, I'm not going to support it. We have to be willing to work together. And I've seen that as I've gone around this district. I, I've met people who, literally hearing that I was a Democrat, have walked away from me, wouldn't talk to me. Uh, a gentleman up in Julian, actually, when he heard that I was a veteran, came back and spoke to me. And we sat down and talked. Next thing I know, we're having a glass of wine talking about immigration reform. And we didn't agree on everything with immigration reform, but we did come to an agreement. And I, I think that can be done with members across the aisle as well, if I'm elected. Congress, how do you deal or how do you deal with the issues of bipartisanship civilly? So we, in the, uh, the House of Representatives, we, we, we pass a lot of uh, bipartisan bills all the time. And it's, it's not as much a, a, uh, a partisan deal as it is a House and Senate deal. Harry Reid has the Senate locked down and that, that makes it appear like we're not doing anything. But so the House is passing it. But the, if you answer very easily, if somebody has a good idea that makes sense, that is in line with my values, and I, I will work with them, absolutely. If they don't, then I won't. You get an extra minute. I can't respond to myself. <laughs> we go to the next question uh, for Mr. Hunter from uh, Mr. Lynn. The Affordable Care Act is one of the most controversial pieces of legislation in recent history. Um, do you support repealing it? Amending it or keeping it as it is? Repealing it and, and replacing it. And here's what we've got to do. Here's, here's what we've got to do with the Affordable Care Act. The, the Affordable Care Act has changed health care as, as we know it in this country forevermore. You, you will get... You, your health care will be uh, more expensive. And, and I know that Mr. Kimber deals in, in health care. This is what he does. It, it, it's going to be more expensive. The quality is going to be lower. Please ask the audience to show respect. And, and it's going to be harder to access. That's, what, that's what's happened with health care. Let me tell you how you uh, fix health care. You have a free market health care system to where doctors can compete and hospitals can compete across states, across state lines, so that individuals can buy health care just like businesses do and use pre-tax dollars and you let the market work. The market works. That's why everybody wants to do uh, business in the U.S. market. They don't want to manufacture in the U.S., but they want to be here because the market system works. Freedom works. And you ought to take that and you ought to apply it to health care. But that's not what this president and that's not what Democrats did. And by the way, there was not a, a single Republican vote. Even the most moderate Republican in the House of Representatives would not vote yes on Obamacare. Why? Because it's making health care more expensive. It's, it's making it cost a lot more than it should. It's, it's uh, lower quality, and you're not going to have the access to doctors. I, I have talked to thousands of people. I have talked to thousands of people that have already lost their health care, where their, where their premiums have doubled, tripled. Some of them are in this room right here, people that I, that I know, and that's happened to them. It doesn't work. More government involvement and more regulation when you live in an open market environment where competition and free enterprise does work, Obamacare is not the answer. So I am for repealing it, replacing it, and actually getting something that uh, works and is competitive. Wow. Okay, um, so as quickly as I can, I mean, Unfortunately, not working in the healthcare field, there's a lot that you do not understand. Um, I'll, I'll try to summarize this real quick. Now, some of you, now, just to be on record, for those who don't know, I do support universal healthcare, plain and simple. Uh, somebody who does, I've heard this for the past four years. We will repeal and replace, but where is that replacement? Because I would agree the affordable, I would agree the Affordable Care Act may not be the most perfect thing, but free market is not the answer. I mean, read the Washington Post last week that published an article about the surgeon who was out of network charged this patient $117,000 for surgery that cost 6000 
I, in the first two months of this year, I've seen more patients than I did in six months of last year. You tell me if the quality is going down, that's really insulting. There's nothing changed in terms of the quality. Try, try looking somebody in the face that doesn't have health care insurance. And I'm asking for your I'm asking. I was up in Ramona at a town hall, a um, little coffee shop in Ramona, and this man pulled over the side of the road, his finger in my chest telling me he was a Republican. You know, why am I even here? I asked him what his issue was. He told me it was health care. So I asked him, what type of insurance do you have? And he told me he didn't have any insurance. This is a man who has his own job. He, act, he supports himself, supports his family very well, but he cannot afford the insurance. We were able to pull up the uh, California, uh, Cover California and show him what his rate would be. And that man wanted to sign up right on the spot. Yeah. He told me that if the costs are going out of control, there are some people. It has not worked for everybody, but what does? Tell me what works for everybody. It, nothing ever works for everybody, but the most, more people are getting help out of this than are being hurt by it. Yeah. Otherwise, and don't tell me free market. Come up with your solution. Free market is not the answer. We'd also like to, to ask the audience, while applause to say you support a position is more than acceptable, Who's and hisses is very middle school and we're a college campus. So here's what uh, free market means. It means hospitals having to disclose all of their analytics, all of their numbers, so that you are not paying $20,000 for the surgeon's gloves during your uh, surgery. We, you can buy gloves for thousands for $1.99 on Amazon.com. So why, when I got surgery six months ago on my on my knee, did they cost me $30 for the uh, uh, surgeon's gloves? Because it is government run. It, it's called competition. If all of the healthcare companies and all the insurance companies throughout the United States had to compete against each other, you, you don't think healthcare in Arkansas is cheaper than it is in California? Why? Because Californians tack on regulation after regulation after regulation after regulation, and so we pay for healthcare that is not as good as other states and is more expensive than other states. We ought to allow a cross-state competition. That's free market. And, and, and I would disagree with you. Your, your numbers are not right. You have more people losing their insurance and more people where their insurance premiums are skyrocketing. And, and here's where it affects the rates. Here's where it affects the rates. It, it doesn't affect the individual, uh, the worst, directly. It affects all the small businesses and medium-sized businesses that hire the majority of Americans. That's who it affects directly, translating to fewer jobs, lower paying jobs, and more expensive health care. And again, like you, I will, I will disagree with your numbers. Because again, I work in this industry and have been for the past 30 years. Again, we go back to, if you talk about a free market system, healthcare should not be a profit-driven industry, which is why I support universal healthcare. We served in the military as did I, and we both were, uh, we both had the same kind of healthcare, and I, I really like the military healthcare, as do many veterans that I know. Medicare is a great system, and we all know what Medicare runs on versus the private healthcare sector. I mean, seven cents on the dollar versus 27 cents, for private health care. So where is that profit going to? Health care should not be a profit-driven industry. Yeah. So we're, ready, we're ready to move to round two. The audience initiated questions. The first question from the audience questions will be given by Mr. Lynn and goes to uh, Mr. Kimber. Uh, Mr. Kimber, do you support the airstrikes against Iraq and Syria? ISIL, and do you support sending ground troops to either of these regions? What strategy do you support for dealing with ISIL terrorists? Um, the short answer is yes, I do support the airstrikes. Uh, I know Mr. Hunter did vote against it, and I actually understand his reasons for not wanting to arm rebels who we may end up having to fight someday with our own weapons and with our training. Uh, but the question is, if we're not going to do that, are we just going to sit by and let this happen? I mean, the rest of the world is looking to us for an answer and how we are going to respond to this problem. And we're now starting to build coalitions with the countries over there, the UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. I do not support putting boots on the ground, though, ever. But I think the bigger question is, if you're not going to fund this, 
And again, I, under, I understand his reason for not doing it, but then what is your solution? Because to do nothing is not an answer or a solution. It's not just going to go away. Mr. Hunter. So I'm, I'm confused. Number, number one, the vote that we had in the House was about arming is Islamic Syrians uh, who were considered uh, rebels. It was not about striking in Syria or striking in Iraq. It was about the U.S. giving our technology and our weapons and our tactics and our communications gear to Syrian moderates, which I would argue don't exist at all. That's what I, uh, I uh, voted against. You, you can't do that and not have boots on the ground either. If you're going to train them, it takes Americans to train them. And what, what we're doing right now is doing what happened in Iraq and doing what happened in Afghanistan. I am totally for bombing the hell out of ISIS, crushing them and wiping them off the face of the earth. Okay? But, 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 that doesn't mean, but that doesn't mean that you take Americans and put them in to hold ground in, in, uh, in Syria or in Iraq. That's, that's absurd. You're not going to have American military holding ground, fending off Assad and ISIS and all of these different groups. Let me tell you, the last thing that you do when you have a, a bunch of crazy, warring factions going at each other, the last thing you do is arm them. Trust me. I don't disagree. Again, I, I'm not, I don't advocate putting any boots or soldiers on the ground. I understand what your stance is. And I understand the need for uh, people who are instructing, but I'm talking about actual people fighting. I don't support that. And, and, uh, let me close with this on, on this issue. The real threat with ISIS isn't what's happening over there. They have no Navy. They have no intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear tips. They have, they have no Air Force. The only way that they can touch us here is by crossing our uh, land border, by coming into the, the uh, United States and planning attacks on Americans in this country. If you want to stop ISIS and make sure that they don't attack us in the homeland, then you uh, kill them where they are, but you also make sure they can't come in through our uh, southern border. Because that's, that's where it's still. That's where it's still. We had a question from the audience, which I didn't see Carver here, but I'm going to follow up with it, regarding the southern border. The question begins with Mr. Hunter, and then go to Mr. Kemper. Since we have so many people in the United States who are undocumented, who come in other ways than just across the border, people have come in visas and have uh, stayed beyond their visas, is the southern border the number one line of defense we need to focus on, or do we really need to start looking at the people who are coming in through our airports? coming in through cruise ships, coming in through Canada, at least as much, if not more. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, you I mean, that over the summer? Uh, no, it, it needs to be done the same. You have, you have thousands of people that, that have gotten visas, student visas into this country and working visas who just disappeared. You don't know who they are. We're the number one entry point in the United States in San Diego for Somalis. The Somalis in Somalia know the name of the federal judge that grants asylum here in San Diego. They know her name over there. Because everybody knows that if you want to sneak in here, if you want to get into the U.S., and if you want to harm Americans, that's how you do it. You cross the southern land border. But you do have those outstanding student visas. You have the outstanding travel visas. That, that all should have been fixed post 9-11. But it was not. You had this, this uh, big monstrosity called Homeland Security created, which stops us all at the airport. But it does not make sure that people that are over here on visas have to go home on time. It does not make, make sure that, that student visas that people with student visas have to go home on time. And that's, that's what needs to be fixed on this. And you gotta have a system, you're gonna talk Southern Border, like E-Verify, where you make sure that every single person working in this country is a United States citizen. That means we're all in the same place here. I'm just curious about it. So HR 2220, um, you sit on an immigration committee, uh, immigration reform I don't actually. subcommittee, or yeah. it's listed on your website. Is it's not. I'm on transportation and armed services. Okay. I'm on immigration. It's still on your website, uh, your house website. It is, as of yesterday. Roger, Mr. Kim. Okay. What have you said? I, um, but I, I did hear you last year when I asked about immigration reform, and I've heard you talk a lot about border security. I'm just curious. This bill, which uh, has been sponsored by many of your colleagues, mostly the state borders of Texas, Arizona, and California, and. Again, I know you, that's one of your big stances, border security, so what are you doing more about that? I mean, I've read the bill, and although 
I mean, it's only sponsored by Republicans. There are many things in there I would support as well. The question is, since border security is one of your biggest stances, why haven't you as well as co-sponsored this, and why aren't you working with the Democrats? To, because I know I've heard you say you don't want to talk about immigration until the border is secure. Okay, then what are you doing to secure the border? 30 second rebuttal, Mr. Hunt. Yeah, sure. Number one, you can't just pull one of these, these bills. There's a, whole, a lot of people doing a whole lot of things. I don't know what HR 2220 yeah. is, uh, but if I was prepared for that, I could ask you some things you probably don't know about too. Right? Sure. So here's what I would say. Excuse me. If you just secure the border and you don't have anything in the interior, meaning you have, you have no interior security, you have no E-Verify system, just doing the southern border doesn't do anything. But if you secure the border first and you put in these systems, then the immigration uh, debate kind of goes away. Because in that fantasy land, the border is secure forever. Meaning in 10 years, you're not going to have 20 million illegal aliens in this country that have come over because the border is now secure. So then we can look at the immigration issues that we have. The problem with that House bill and other bills uh, like it, it is that they don't put border security first. And I don't trust the Senate or the House of Representatives to put border security before the other types of amnesty that they want to put through. Security first, then we'll work on the immigration side. I think you're going to have a nice question. I was going to ask you similar to this question we had before, but um, I think there's a lot more we need to uh, talk about in this one. So another question was, what is your solution to the problem of, of immigration in this country? Um, you have 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It'll be 15. Thank you. Well, I, I, okay, to start, I do support uh, DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. But we have a lot of people that were brought up here, not of their own volition, yet they've been educated in our schools, they've gone to our colleges, and I've, I've heard people say, well, they've done it at the taxpayer's expense. So, as Republicans say that they're very fiscally conservative, very fiscally responsible, why would you want to throw away that investment? I mean, these are people who have shown their passion to be an American, so I think you start with the uh, children that are brought, brought up here first. But, I mean, immigration reform in itself is not just a one, uh, one fixed issue. I mean. There is HR 15, uh, which uh, a colleague of yours, Representative Denham, has signed on to. It is a bipartisan bill which does deal with this, and he himself has stated that he believes in a pathway to citizenship. So he too lives in an area that is uh, the demographics. Uh, there's a high Latino population in his district, as is in yours. So the question is, um, why aren't you doing? Why haven't you signed on to that bill? I mean, we talk about bipartisanship. Mr. Hunter, you asked me how you would solve immigration, and you asked me a question. I yes. still didn't hear the answer. I, I, I support DACA. Here's what you do. What, what you don't do is let people in, in line in front of people who want to become legal immigrants. That's what you don't do. You don't leave the southern border unsecure. That's what you don't do. You, you have to have a secure border. You have to have E-Verify. So once again, you can make sure that every single person working in this country is an American citizen. You have to go through all of those those different uh, waivers for visas and different visas and make sure that we don't have people here who, who want to harm Americans. The, the main point of border security right now, in my point of view, especially with ISIS, is national security. It's a national security issue. You worry about the immigration issue afterwards, but if you, if you have a, tra a, a, a uh, horrible event like 9-11, and it's not done by Americans, it's, it's, it's uh, done by people who have overstayed visas or got here through the southern border, maybe then we can finally secure it and realize it is a national security issue. But that's how you fix it. Don't overcomplicate it. Secure the border, have E-Verify implemented, check out all of those visas, and it, it uh, will sort itself out, and then we can work the immigration issue Mr. after it's secured. Uh, I would disagree that it just sorts itself out. I mean, assuming a problem will just go away if you fix something else. I, I agree with the Board of Security and E-Verify, but I don't know how that resolves certain problems. Again, to go back to the Deferred Action Childhood Arrivals, are you telling me that people who've been here since the age of five or ten even, that they've gone through our schools, been educated, they should get to the back of the line or go back to a country that they don't even know. Mr. Hunter, you sure. have 30 seconds. Number one, you should make what, what you should want, because you're running for the House of Representatives, is you should want that debated in front of the American people by Congress and the House of Representatives. We did not debate that. That was a unilateral action done by this president. 
that, that, that some have seen as illegal. The president doesn't get to say, this used to be against the law, but now it's okay. That, that is something that should have been discussed in light of day, in front of the American people by Congress, and then we can vote on it, and then you can hold somebody up here accountable. Mr. Mr. Kimber just said it's okay if the president does it, that's fine with me. I don't believe that. Actually, no, that's not That's what happened with that. Two years ago, the speaker had a We're moving on to our next question. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this will be to Mr. Hunter to begin. Uh, this area, this district in particular, is going to be impacted by what's going on in Iraq, probably more than any other place in the country because of the large company and population that is here, and Iraqi Christians, one way or another, no matter what happens on the ground, there are going to be a lot of refugees. What should be the federal response to the crisis, which is brewing right now, and to the people who will be coming here looking for refuge from the crisis in Iraq? Okay. Starting with you. Okay, number one, going again. You, you have to strike ISIS where they are all the time. And you're probably going to have to do it in perpetuity. Radical Islam will be a threat for me, for my kids, for their kids, and forever and ever. That's what radical, I mean, radical Islam, I mean, you had somebody in Oklahoma chop off a woman's head today. Okay? That, that was an Islamist, a radical Islamist murder. You're going to face this forever. You're going to have to maintain a force there so we can kill the, the uh, bad guys whenever possible and make sure that they can't attack us here. You, you have to give humanitarian aid to uh, Kurdistan. Kurdistan's taking all these refugees, uh, Jordan too. We owe them that through the World Health Organization and the UN. We ought to be providing some humanitarian relief. We ought to be arming Kurdistan. We ought to be arming the Peshmerga so that they can take these guys out on their own and you don't have to have American troops there. But that, but that takes us supporting them. You've got to put pressure on Turkey. Turkey should not be able to aid and abet the ISIS folks. You, you have ISIS folks going into, into Turkey, and this is, this is not official uh, reporting, but just word on the street that I have from the Kurdish community here. You, you, ought, you ought not have ISIS folks getting help in Turkey, getting medical help in Turkey, and being able to rearm and refit and go back and fight from Turkey. So those are, those are a few things I think that need to get done that don't include training more Syrians to fight other Syrians. Mr. Kemper. Okay. Um, I understood the question, though, to be about what we're going to do about the refugees, specifically. Yeah. Um, I know one of the things that can be done uh, has to do with essentially the numbers that are assigned to who can come into this country. And part of it is those numbers apply to the whole family, whereas the numbers should just apply to the sponsor themselves, whereas their immediate family members are not included in that number. I know that certain local leaders are looking to raise that number and I think part of the reason we created part of this problem so we do owe these people we are responsible for this we need to take responsibility Mr. Sure, we have we have legislation that I'm already on in fact with uh, Juan Vargas a Democrat from South Bay that, that does this that raises the uh, caps for Iraqi and Syrian asylees and Kurdish asylees especially Christians um, and people that are, that are getting persecuted in, in that area. So we're, we, are, we are doing that. We recognize that there's a humanitarian need. But in, in the end, you, you, you can't just... America, in the end, has to take care of itself. And what we should do is help these countries to maintain their, their own stability and their own forces so that, so that they have a thriving economy. And maybe they'll, they can help us one day in 25 years as opposed to the U.S. taking the lead on all these things all the time. <laughs> To their next question from uh, Mr. Irwin to uh, Mr. Cooper. Now that uh, Attorney General Eric Holder is stepping down, do you think the Fast and the Furious? Do you think the Fast and the Furious investigation will continue? And what is your position on that issue? Uh, I think the investigation will continue. Uh, unfortunately, I think they there's a term we use in the military called "beat a dead horse." And it seems like a lot of members on uh, these committees just continue to go after something. I don't dispute that this was wrong. I don't think it should have been done, uh, but it seems like it's been asked and answered. Fast and Furious, talk about beating a uh, dead horse. Fast and Furious is over a, a, a dead U.S. War Patrol. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's what it's, it's, it's about. I mean, coming into Eric Holder, I don't think Holder wants to be in office much longer. Once once the new investigations start. Um, I don't think it's going to change anything. I think this president's going to bring somebody on who's as partisan as he is and ideological as he is. I don't think it's going to change much, but him, him being gone takes him out of the uh, limelight. I'm sure Eric Holder will go get a nice 
Nice cushy law job, making a few uh, million bucks a year, and good for him. Glad he's gone. Next question to Mr. Hunter from the audience. Uh, the Pentagon has officially proclaimed that climate change is of strategic concern to the United States. What do you think, if anything, should be done to address issues related to climate change? Number one, the uh, Pentagon needs to pull its head out of the sand. So, we, have, we don't have enough ships. We don't have enough, uh, enough ships. We don't have enough planes. We don't have enough F-22s. We don't have enough people. There are people getting out of the military right now because they're being, they're being forced out. But climate change is more dangerous than ISIS. Climate change is more dangerous than nuclear North Korea. Climate change is more dangerous than a nuclear Iran. Climate change is more dangerous than Pakistan. Baloney. This is an ideological partisan push by the administration within the, the Department of Defense. The military is there to fight and win wars. Not, not, not play out some, some social experiment where we force, where, where we force the, the uh, military to buy algae food, buy ships, buy rockets, buy missiles, buy what we need to do to win wars. Don't waste your money. Okay, so to your comment about wasting money, we are wasting money in terms of the drought, record drought that we're suffering, the number of fires that we're having. I mean, look at the fires that we happened this year, Escondido, San Marcos, Julian, uh, now the King Fire, and the, the fire department's already exhausted the amount of money that they use for these emergency services, so they're going to have to get more money, and I'm sure from the federal government. You're talking about a waste of money, not addressing drought is going to result in a waste of money. You can ignore it all you want, but it's you. Ask the farmers, you live in a, you live in a district that's heavily agriculture, Ask them what they think about the water drought situation. Ask the Farm Bureau. That's one of their number one issues right now. Now, I've talked to the uh, Mount Helix uh, Water Board as well as uh, Padre Dam, and they're doing water recycling. And these things are, this is what uh, some of the money needs to go to invest in. I don't deny that we need strong defense, we need planes, we need ships, but you can't deny uh, climate change. You just can't do it. Again, yeah, Mr. Kimber didn't answer the actual question about the military saying that climate change is our number one threat. Because it isn't. There is no answer to that because climate change is not the, one, the uh, number one threat. What I've done in Congress here in San Diego and in Southern California, we built reservoirs. We, we, we use federal dollars to build dams. We, we, we've done a whole lot on, on water storage and reclamation. You have desalinization plants going in in Camp Pendleton and North County. We're doing a whole lot of stuff on water, and frankly, we're much better off than Central California is here in San Diego because of the steps that we've taken. But that doesn't mean that the U.S. military should take your taxpayer dollars that you're using to make sure that we remain a free country and protect our interests and allies and spend it on climate change in whatever way the DOD feels is the right way to do it. That's a misuse of taxpayer money, and they're wrong to do it. I invoke my moderator's right to ask a couple follow-ups. First one is for uh, Mr. Kimber. Do you have a plan that would address the issues and solve the problems of uh, the droughts and, and, and making that go away? Can you describe what it is? <laughs> well, to make it go away, no. I mean, but my plans, uh, and echo some of the things that Mr. Hunter's talked about doing, as I mentioned, I uh, met with the different water boards, and one of the biggest things that they're doing which will help, I think, dramatically is the recycling of water. But right now they're only recapturing about 50% of it. And there is this public perception that recycled water is not safe. Uh, I, I would say just having been in the military, on board a ship, that's what we do. I mean, some of the water is collected through desalinization, and I, I do, I'm aware of the desal plant. But much of the water that we use for consumption is recycled water, and it is very safe. But we need to uh, make the public more aware of this in terms of ending the drought. I mean, I, I can't make it rain, so we just have to uh, continue working on, I think the recycling is the biggest effort in combination with the desalinization. Mr. Hunter, what about that? All right, so we've, we have tried in the House of uh, uh, Representatives over and over and over to, to have San Francisco 
release the water that they have up, up there because it's, it's damped off for that little fish, the Delta smelt. You have, you have an entirely dry Central California. Talk about farmers going out of business. It is dry now. There, there are signs saying, thank you, Pelosi, for the dust bowl as you drive through Central California. Because Nancy, Nancy Pelosi has created, there is an actual drought, but she has created a water shortage in what used to be the, the uh, bread basket of the United States. And it no longer is. It's, it's dry because they care more about the Delta smell than they do people. And I mean, most Democrats do. That's, that's why they destroy economies, and, and that's why you have a dust bowl system in Central California. Uh, my second uh, follow up is for you, Congressman. You mentioned that you don't uh, believe that climate change is the largest threat the Pentagon should be worried about. Do you consider it to be a serious threat? I, I think climate change is going to be happening. It was happening millions of years ago, and it's happening now. So let me, let me give you an example. There is climate change. I don't dispute that. I, I think that the climate is, is changing. And I'm not saying that the weather is changing. I, I believe in actual climate change. The, the question is, are we the ones causing it? We, we live in a relatively cool time on Earth right now. When you, when you look back millions of years, when you, if you look back millions of years, we live in a relatively cool time. The, the temperatures on Earth, be, before there were uh, humans, the temperatures on Earth, before there were humans on, on Earth, have both been higher, much higher, and much lower than they are now. Humans, I would please ask the audience to show respect or to go do something else tonight. So the main question is, is there a human caused climate change? That I do not buy. Is the climate changing? Is it going to be getting colder during an ice age and, and warmer during a uh, warmer period? Yes. But I, I don't think that uh, we're the ones doing it. Mr. Kemper, so um, despite all the scientists that say to the contrary, you want to dispute it. I work in I work in neurosurgery. I'm a physician assistant, and I, I would just say, I mean, if 98 doctors tell you you have a brain tumor and need surgery, you don't want to listen to the two that say don't. But, but that aside, okay, let's just say, for argument's sake, let's I'll agree with you, and just let's say it's cooler now than it ever used to be. What's wrong with taking steps towards addressing climate change, such as alternative energy, such as recycling water, recycling, uh, getting electric cars, building these power stations for the electric cars? What's wrong with approaching that? These will provide jobs, they will create jobs. What's wrong with approaching it from that viewpoint if you just want to not believe in climate change? Right, the next question comes from me to Mr. Kember. Citizens United, good decision, bad decision? Uh, Terrible. Uh, I think we've all seen, you know, the amount of money that's flowing in as a result of Citizens United has really, uh, well, I can't think of a nice word to say, how it's really uh, tainted, okay, I'll use that, tainted the political system. Um, it, you know, I hear this over and over how it's all about the money. And in, to some extent, I guess it is nowadays. I mean, you can go ahead and donate um, to certain PACs now, unlimited amounts, and without uh, any I identification of who's making these donations to some committees. And you know, unlimited contributions are going into campaigns, and it seems that more and more are from corporations. Uh, I, I know, Mr. Hunter, a lot of your contributions come from the, you know, the committees that you sit on such as the shipbuilding, um, some companies like that, some of the defense industry are also big contributors to your campaign. Mr. Hunter, one minute. So uh, I think it, it was the right decision. We, we, we live um, under the U.S. Constitution. People can believe in what they, what they want to believe in, and they can spend as much money as they want to spend on, on what they believe in. How, how else do you have millionaires like the owner of Facebook and others doing these, putting tens of millions of dollars into their immigration pushes or, or their global climate change? You know, Leonardo Di, uh, DiCaprio puts in tens of millions of dollars towards his climate change stuff. You all think that that's fine. But when Republicans do it or conservatives do it, then it's bad, evil corporate money. Number one, Congress cannot take corporate money. Congress cannot take corporate money. It's, it's illegal. So, so at the same time, 
how do you get money out of, out of the influence of politics but recognize that everybody has the right to do what they believe and spend money on what they believe in? I think that this, this, the uh, Supreme Court had to make a decision. They made the right one. It, it'd be nice if there was some middle ground where you could spend as much as you want but have, not have that money influence the, the uh, races in any bad way. Mr. Kimber. Uh, I, I would agree. And, you know, you say that it's okay when it happens for Democratic, such as immigration for climate change, and I, I disagree. It's not okay there either. I, I think it should be a level playing field. I would take it away and it should be applied to both. I, I'm not singling out one party or the other as being the guilty. I, they're both culpable in this. Mr. Hunt? Sure. Uh, on a relatively agreeing note, we move into our uh, final candidate statements. Before we do, I always like to tell audiences whenever I have the chance, I'm a professor, I like to talk, that we're here to promote civil discourse because you know civility politics if you go to the greek word for it is turning the poly the many into the polis the community and the greeks used to consider those who pursue the good of the community to pursuing the highest good to be the most noble amongst themselves i don't remember hearing a lot of people say that politicians are noble when they are doing the work the rest of us have not I would like to say to both of our candidates, I really appreciate and honor the work you do, and I would like the audience to give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> On that note, we will have three minute closing remarks, followed by 30 second responses, as long as the candidates would like to do their 30 second responses or until our host asks us to leave. We'll begin with Mr. Hunter. Hey, uh, first off, thank you again. Thanks for doing this and taking time. And, and to all of you, whether obviously there's a few of you who may disagree with me, but thank you for being here too. Because truly that's what this is all about. And, and the fact that you came out on a Friday, thank you for doing it. I want to thank my uh, son and two daughters for being here. I, I have to go to all of your stuff, so now you have to come to my stuff. <laughs> Mom, and my mom's here, and my lovely wife is here. Thank you very much. And all my friends and supporters, and those who don't, thank, thank you very much for being here. You know, I uh, said it in the very beginning, for our system of government to work, we have to be able to govern ourselves better than those who would wish to govern us can. That makes sense? Meaning we, we control our own destiny. We, we govern ourselves. The federal government does not know what you need. A one-size-fits-all federal plan, 3,000 pages or, or uh, 5,000 pages of legislation, still doesn't know what you need as Americans. The way that we thrive in this country is we have the opportunity to do whatever we want to do within the bounds of good judgment, law, and order. That's, that's what makes us on, on entrepreneurs. That's what makes us go out and do amazing things. And it's, it's because of regulation and that burdensome regulation and the unaccountability because you can't hold me responsible anymore because all this stuff is being done by the Environmental Protection Agency. It's not Mr. Kemper, it's not me. It's these bureaucracies that are tearing down the American way. In California, it's the bureaucracies that are destroying commerce in the state. That's why you see business after business after, after business leaving California. Because there's other states in which it's much easier and much more profitable to do business. That's because regulation kills. And we got to break out of that. we got to bring our corporate tax rate down, bring these countries back from China and India, get them back here in the U.S., make American goods, and then us Americans, we can go buy those American goods and make sure that our neighbors and our family have good jobs because there's manufacturing back in this country. The number one job, I think, the number one job that I have as a U.S. congressman is national security. That's it, because all of this other stuff, everything that we've talked about here, everything, from climate change to, the, uh, to immigration, None of that matters if we get hit again like 9-11. None of that matters if we get hit again like 9-11. That is the federal government's number one job, is to make sure that the people in this country and our allies are safe from harm, and that we don't get attacked, and that we're not attacked overseas. I actually uh, believe that the federal government has overstepped its bounds in almost everything that there is, but there are a few things that it does well, and that's one is national security, the other is transportation and infrastructure. We can build big bridges pretty well. The federal government can because they're big jobs. Those, those are things that the federal government should be doing. What we should not be doing, education. Let the communities, let the families and the cities and the counties handle things that they, where they know what is best for their citizens. Because there's people sitting back in D.C. They don't know. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here.
Uh, I want to thank again our uh, host veterans campaign, thank our, uh, our moderators here, and again Mr. Hunter, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I, I want to thank the guests who have come here this evening that have supported me over the past few years. Uh, as never having been in elected office, most of you have met for the very first time and never would have met otherwise if it had not been for this opportunity. I've met people, both Democrats, Republicans, and all have welcomed me, maybe not some as much as others, but uh, I, I've really enjoyed the, time to, uh, the chance to get to know many of you, sit down and talk to you about what the issues are that bother you the most throughout this district that you live in. I agree with Mr. Hunter that the government is not here to tell you how to live your lives or to fix your problems. But those who are elected do have a job to do, and that's not an excuse for not doing the job. It's not an excuse for not addressing things such as climate change, for not addressing immigration reform, for not addressing health care. These are, national security is absolutely paramount, but these other problems are not any less important. I would like to, be, I would like to work with you to help with these uh, issues if I am elected. Again, just because government is not there to solve your problems, doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing the jobs that they were elected to do. Yeah. And thank you for your time, and I appreciate you guys who came out this evening. Gentlemen, shake hands. Thank you all very much for coming tonight.